Hey guys, how are you? Hey, how? How is everybody? Give me a second here. I'm, um, I just jumped off a class that ran like a minute over and uh, for some reason, my computer doesn't want to open up or let me get to the PowerPoint for this class. So give me a second to get there. How's everybody doing on a Friday? Great, thanks. Talk to me about your weekend coming up. Anybody have anything real estate related, business related going on that uh, coming up this weekend? Practice scripts. <laughs> Practice scripts. Gee, there's a thought. I love it. All right, let's see. What am I looking for? Mm -hmm. I am trying to find this. There it is. All right. I'm not sure why my PowerPoint is giving me such grief right now, but we're good. All right. Anything else going on? Anybody have any open houses going on this weekend? Oh, there I am. I'm back. I see a lot of faces that it seems like I just saw you a minute ago. We were in the other class, right? So a couple program notes uh, real fast. This is um, the session in the lead gen module on lead conversion. And uh, we had planned that this was going to be the last session, but last Friday when we took that off uh, for Juneteenth, it pushed everything back. So even though the schedule that I gave you early on said that we would be done today, we will actually finish up on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we're going to slide right into the, we just toggle back and forth between the lead generation class and Ignite. Ignite 2.0 kicks off again on Wednesday. It's just the same time slot, 11 to 12. Uh, this actually goes 11 till 1230, but Ignite is only a third, a, a 60 minute time slot. So it'll be 11 to 12. You will get an email from me on that later today, just acknowledging that Ignite 2.0 kicks off again. That runs for, um, 16 sessions. So that's going to take us really through the month of July and actually into August, I believe, um, is where that course is going, right? So that's coming next. Um, but this is the course, and this is, this is a really interesting course for me because, you know, lead conversion is something that I think uh, is so critical in, in, in all sales. And yet I think that in real estate sales, we don't really spend a lot of time teaching lead conversion and pipeline management to the degree that I think it really needs to be. And uh, so, so some of what you're going to hear in today's session comes from the KW university stuff. A lot of it I've kind of added to it because I think it's just it was missing. And so I threw that back in. So I'm going to jump into the PowerPoint real fast and give me a second to do that. I'm going to do a quick screen share here. And if all goes well, you can see my PowerPoint. You can see what I'm seeing. Somebody just give me a thumbs up. There's Danny again with his thumb. Thank you, sir. All right, lead conversion. You know, here's the thing I'll just start with. Here's where we are. We're, we're, we're at this part of the Parthenon in this course. We've built the platform of prospecting and validity and marketing and, that, and all that stuff, right, that everyone's business should be built upon. We talked about all these different lead generation levers and strategies, and again, farming, working within your own sphere and your database, open houses for sell by owners, expireds. What I would encourage everyone to do is to kind of explore all of these a little bit, right? But what you really want to do is master maybe one or two. Um, find what works best and really double down on it. You're, you're not going to be world class at every lead generation style that there is, every lead generation approach that there is. You may be better. I was way better at open houses than I was at for sell by owner calls. And so I didn't really do much for sell by owner work. I'd really doubled down on what I did well, which is opens. Other people are really, really, really good at calling expireds and they're not as good at open. So explore all of them. You're probably going to need to have a couple different ways to fill your lead pipeline, which we're going to talk about today. But when you find what's working for you, double down, quadruple down on it. Now we're gonna move though towards lead conversion because generating leads is great, but if you don't convert them, who cares, right? Um, I will tell you in my estimation, I, I think that for most agents, lead generation is not actually even their biggest problem. I just noticed that the chat box lit up. Let me peek on that. Do I have office hours today? Yes, I do, one o'clock. Um, I don't think lead gen is everybody's biggest problem. Uh, we talk about lead gen, lead gen, lead gen, 
But I think for a lot of people, for most people, we come in contact with enough leads over the course of a year that if we converted them, we would have the income that we want, but we don't convert well enough. And I think it's for most agents, it's a lead conversion problem as much as a lead generation problem. And, and if you look at it, there's companies like Zillow that have invested a lot of money into recognizing that, and I'm not going to say good, bad, or indifferent. I'm not going to get political about Zillow right now. But there's a lot of agents that I know, even still today, even inside of our company, who spend a lot of money to Zillow to generate leads for them. And, um, you know, what happens is if you spend enough money with Zillow, they will actually nurture the lead themselves because what they recognized was they were capturing leads and they were selling leads to the agents. And what would happen would be that the lead would be would be so early in the buying cycle that they weren't really ready to talk to an agent yet. The agent would reach out, the lead wouldn't follow up. And the, and the agent said, these leads kind of suck. I can't believe I'm paying this much money. Nobody's calling me back. Nobody's taking my call. And what Zillow said is, look, it's not a bad lead. It's just early in the decision cycle. It needs to be percolated for a period of time. If you pay enough money with it for us, if you give us enough money, we'll percolate that lead ourselves. And then when it's ready to go, then we'll, see, we'll give it to you at that point. And you, you have to spend a fair chunk of change for Zillow to percolate the lead on your behalf. I'm talking thousands of dollars a month, but they'll do it for you if you spend enough. There are other companies whose whole business model it is to percolate real estate agent leads. There was one company uh, that's called OpCity. It was a company that uh, back in 2018, I believe, I'm looking at the byline here. Yeah, 2018 in, the, in August, the um, Move Inc., which is the owner and operator of Realtor.com, recognized that if Zillow was going to go out there and percolate these, e these leads for their top paying customers and give them better quality leads, that if, if Realtor.com wanted to be competitive, that they're going to have to do the same thing. And they were figuring, how are we going to percolate these leads ourselves? They just went out and they bought this company called OpCity. It was a tech startup that whole business model was to take this early inquiry lead and nurture it along through lots of different means, through text messaging, through emails, through periodic phone calls, through artificial intelligent bots that would have conversations. And Realtor.com spent $210 million to purchase OpCity to do the lead percolation because what they recognized was real estate agents don't nurture leads well. It's not that we don't generate the leads. It's that when we generate a lead who isn't ready to take action today, we fall flat on our face as an industry. $210 million invested in purchasing OpCity to do that for realtors. How do we do that ourselves, right? Unless you got $210 million to spend, how are we going to do that? What are the systems? The first thing I just want to share is this idea of a sales funnel and a sales pipeline. And this is what the sales funnel looks like. At the top of the funnel is that early stage lead that is just kind of in awareness. They're just kind of exploring. What we have learned through research is that consumers on the internet, while we scream bloody murder about our privacy rights, our privacy rights, we are so willing to give our personal information to anybody who asks for it. And yet what we find is that the average real estate consumer will cough up their telephone number, their name, and their email address on average anywhere between 24 to 30 months before they're anywhere near making a real estate purchase or, or listing their home. That's two years. And so when we capture this top of the funnel lead, which is in awareness mode, they're not calling us back. And yet we still got to stay engaged. We still got to nurture them along so that then they start to get to a place where now I'm really starting to get interested. And in the interest phase, it's different for different folks. But in my experience is that interest level sometimes perks up somewhere within 12 months from taking action. We're going to talk about classifying leads in a moment. But in, for me, when I was actively selling, if I truly believed that you were prepared to legitimately buy or sell or invest within the next 12 months, I was going to probably track you a little bit differently. If you are further out than that, I was just going to keep nurturing you along in my systematic way. We'll get to smart plans for that in a moment. But when you start to express some interest, 
now I want to kind of change gears and track with you a little bit differently. And then the next stage of interest is moving further down in the funnel to a point where not only am I interested, but now I've got to start making some decisions. Now I'm going to decide who am I going to talk to? What company, what agent, who am I going to use to list my home? What should I list my home for? What repairs should I do before I put my house on the market? Now I'm in a much more active decision-making mode. And for a lot of folks in the real estate side, that could be 30 days before making a decision, who knows what. And then at the very bottom of the funnel are the people that are ready to take action right now. They're ready, they're willing, they're able, they've made all the decisions, they're ready to go. What we want in our lead generation so much is for people to show up right in the action phase. So frequently does it not happen that way that if we don't have a way of moving them through this funnel, we're gonna lose them. You know, we're gonna lose them. And, and, and I, I like the idea of, of a funnel. I think the visual is a good one because if you've ever put water into a funnel, what it does is it moves the water through the funnel and comes out the bottom. And what's implied in the sales funnel, and I'll use another term synonymously, the sales pipeline, what's implied is movement, right? A sales pipeline moves people through these different stages to a point of action the same way that an oil pipeline moves oil from one location to another. Pipelines and funnels are about movement and getting people to continue to progress through the steps. And if we don't have a purposeful strategy on how to do that, what we have is a bucket you know, of names but there are so many people in, in sales, in, in all industries, this is not specific to real estate, all industries who have a book of leads, a book of business, maybe accounts that they're calling on for their company and they've got this whole set of people that they believe are their accounts and their leads and yet no one is progressing through the decisions making cycle. No one is progressing to move closer towards action and what they have is stagnation, right? Think of water. When water flows, it's healthy, it's alive, it's crystally. Things can grow in running and moving water. When water stands still, it gets gross, it gets scummy. Things die inside dead water. And so the sales funnel is how do we keep people moving? And that's the art and the skill that we need to talk about. These are the models. There's conversion points. As people move through these steps, what causes them to convert to the next step? And we have to track and we have to know our business and track our leads in our database and understand how many people do I need to have sort of bouncing around in this awareness phase in order to capture someone who's moving into the interest phase? How many people in this phase do I need to be working with in order to move someone along to this next decision-making phase? How many people in this phase do I need to be talking to in order to get someone to take action? Knowing what your conversions look like and how you influence the movement from one phase to the next is what separates agents and not just agents, great salespeople from salespeople who struggle. So in the Keller Williams language, we have this lead generation model in the top of the funnel. We use prospecting and marketing strategies, all the things we've talked about throughout this course to capture them to get them into the funnel. And in the language of connect, we're referring to leads once again as people that we, we know who they are. They've responded to my Facebook ad or I have their name and number. I know where they are. I can send communication to them, but I, I haven't gotten them interested enough yet to respond back. Once we get two-way communication going, now we've moved into what we're calling contacts. And the model would suggest that with smart plans, We'll touch on them very briefly today. That it's probably 19 touches over the course of a year to get a lead to kind of step up and become a contact. And once they've made a contact, it's about 36 touches a year to stay engaged enough that when the time comes that they move into that next phase of decision, which we will call opportunities in KW Connect, that we're connected enough to them We've cultivated them well enough that we're likely to move to the next phase with them, right? Okay, leads and contacts we touched on may do business with you at some time in the future. Opportunities, ready, willing, and able to do business within a clearly defined timeline. Your opportunities are your biggest priority in terms of how you spend your time. You know, 
you're going to hear me say throughout today that that your time is your most precious commodity. It's everyone's most precious commodity. A at the end of the day, how you spend your time and where you give your time dictates the quality of your life. Um, people, did I just lose you on my screen here? I just had something pop on my screen. Are you guys still here with me? Just chime back in if you are. Yes, yep. we are. Yes. Oh, that's a good thing because my screen just disappeared for a second. So I want to make sure I'm back in my PowerPoint. You see the PowerPoint still? Okay, good. Yes. I, I think we're, whatever that was on my screen, it, it was a little blip, but we're still together. That's good. You know, how you spend your time dictates the quality of your life and who you give your time to. And, and so we've got to make sure that the people that we give our time to are the people that have earned the right to our time. Because people who squander our business time take it away from people who really deserve it in our lives. And so, but your opportunities from a business standpoint are, are your biggest time priority. Getting face to face with them and building enough trust through this process of navigating people through this pipeline, navigating people through the funnel, the relationship that you build with them in the way that you nurture them through these steps of awareness to decision, to, to uh, all that stuff, moving them through, the rapport that you build in that process will make it easier so the one that kind of comes to take a step, they're willing to take it, to take it with you. We touched on these campaigns. I'm not going to review that again. But I do want to jump into smart plans just for a second. And we're not going to go to smart plans in command. I'm going to go into command when we get into opportunities today. But I'm trusting that everyone is familiar enough at this point with smart plans and how they work. And, and what we need to do is, is have smart plans ready to rock so that when I get a lead, when I get, and again, when I get a lead using the language of command, meaning somebody that has jumped into my database, I've got a relationship with you. I have to have a plan of action that's customized in a way that they're more likely to engage. We have built for you in command templates you know we've built you some templates we've got a monthly neighborhood nurture which is once a month it's going to send an email with a list of all the things that are going on in that person's neighborhood in terms of real estate what's new to the market what's sold it'll include things like you know uh, neighborhood amenities and things like that as long as we've built the if people have added those in to command right but we can send a once a month nurture. We've got a bi-weekly neighborhood nurture. There's a quarterly call plan that just puts a reminder every 90 days to say, hey, now's the time that I should be calling Eric. And it reminds me on my dashboard in command. It calls up his contact card. So I see it. I got his phone number. It says, now's your day to call Eric. And I just go ahead and do it. Lots and lots and lots of smart plans are here as templates. But if you really, really want to have success, you're going to customize these to be more in line with what fits for your target audience because it's not one size fits all ever for anything. And yet your target audience based on your unique value proposition is probably going to respond to touches in a different way. If they're more in line with the, the, the thoughts, the language, the temperament of that group. So learning how to customize these smart plans is, is useful. And there's lots of videos out there on that, right? We do lots of classes on that. Chris Gareffa and Elise Dumani and Reese Serino and all those folks are, are experts at what they do. Take time to learn, right? Take the time to learn and build out these smart plans because once you've got the system in place, then it really just runs. It, it's, it's a little bit of energy on the front end to build the system. But once this, once the, highway is in place, the cars can drive. Once the system is in place, as people jump into your lead, your funnel through lead generation activities, you simply put them on a smart plan and you just run with it. In the absence of smart plans, every single one of those leads that jumps into the funnel needs its own plan. It means every single car is off road and we've got to find our own path through the bush it's way easier if there's a path and a road already cut for us to travel, right? The smart plans are really important. Let's make sure we've got that down. Conversion points we touched on. This is the one that's critical. And, and this is the one that we want a lot is from opportunity to appointment, from nurturing, when somebody has raised their hand and expressed that interest, and we're gonna call them an opportunity. 
getting them nurtured along to an appointment. And, and it's not closed for an appointment right away. The, the, the notion of always be closing is just bad sales. It's just, it's just really Bush League. Um, and there's a lot of people that believe in the ABC of selling, always be closing, always be closing. It, it's not always be closing. There's a right time and a wrong time to close for an appointment. And the reason for that is closing is for an appointment. And, and an appointment is a commitment of time and people's time is their most precious priority. So the thing that they're going to be the most reluctant to give up is their time. And so we have to be really judicious and not ask for their time until it's the right time in the relationship to get it right. Or else they're going to create resistance and they're going to feel like we're being too pushy. They're going to feel like we're pushing them into something they're not ready for yet. And I, I, I sort of teasingly say nobody asks to get married on the first date because that's weird. And it feels too crazy to move that fast that quickly. And yet that's what cons customers feel, consumers feel when we ask to meet too early in the game, right? So let's go back and talk about social media inquiries right now, because right now there is a really unique opportunity that a lot of the folks that I'm working with are finding that filling the funnel especially in a time of pandemic where even though we're beginning to open up again, um, not everyone is comfortable going out and meeting in person. Not everyone is comfortable with public open houses and networking events and going out there and meeting in person. And if you do meet in person, please, please, please continue to social distance, distance continue to wear a mask. We have worked so hard in the state of New Jersey to try to flatten this curve and we're doing so well. And yet there's an uptick again as we've opened up. And I guess we should have expected that. Ironically enough, the uptick all around the country tends to be in the younger generation because I think younger people always feel that they're immune to everything. But, but be safe, right? And yet what we know is that lead generation from internet sources is really working really, really well right now because there are people that want to move from, they're moving from awareness into decision and they want information. And, and with well-written ad copy on the internet, we are capturing lots of leads. They are earlier in the process and they do need to be nurtured along. But I learned a long time ago, and I think it was expressed really well by Tim Heil, who is one of the mega agents that Keller Williams has out of Austin, Texas, running expansion teams all throughout the South, that his business really exploded when he recognized that the goal of his lead generation efforts was not really to find someone to go to an appointment today. So much of the time he would get on the phones and he was trying to find a lead that was ready, willing, and able to meet today. And what he found was he was so focused on people that were ready to go today that if you weren't ready to go today, he just kind of threw you back into the ocean. Like he was a fisherman and he just tossed you back in because you were too small. I couldn't keep you. What he recognized was if he could find people who were willing to stay in relationship with him and be nurtured along. And he built his target objectives for lead generation, not from finding two people a day to meet with in an appointment, but to find five people a day who are willing to stay in relationship and be nurtured along. That building his lead generation around finding nurtures ultimately led, because of great systems of staying in touch, that the appointments took care of themselves. If I'm nurturing you along the way, eventually you're going to be ready to go to an appointment. If I'm in relationship with you when you're ready to go to an appointment, we're going to be fine. I'm not worried about the appointments. I'm worried about building nurtures. And social media is a really good way to do that right now. There is a myth that internet leads aren't any good. And I think that, again, internet leads aren't any better or worse than anyone else. They're just further up on the funnel, right? That's why Realtor.com was willing to invest $210 million in purchasing Opsity because they knew that those leads were good. They just needed to be nurtured, right? So when you get internet leads, if you're working with internet leads, and I'd encourage you right now to build some Facebook ad campaigns or, internet or, or Instagram ad campaigns. Learn how to do that from Chris and Reese and, 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 and Elise. There's lots of video out there. Look at uh, the KW 66 Day Challenge uh, version 3.0 on YouTube. Marty Miller runs that. He'll teach you how to do these ads. I think it's a really good idea right now 
for everyone to think about what their budget is in terms of how much they could afford in running ads on a daily and weekly basis and just build some ads that are hyper locally focused that will get people into your funnel and just keep ads running. They, they do need to be changed out. The ads begin to kind of get a little long in the tooth. Facebook algorithms begin to start to not place your ads as well after about two weeks or so. So about every two weeks, maybe every two to three weeks, depending on the volume of leads that you're getting, you'll probably want to change it out with a new ad. What my recommendation is with, with social media ads, though, is that you recognize that social media is really geared better from an advertising standpoint to advertise stuff. And real estate agents are brands. They're not stuff. They're not you can use social and you should use social to kind of create consistent brand awareness. So people see you out there, they get a sense of what you're about, but to get people to click on a, on an ad on Facebook, they're usually looking to purchase something. That's why Facebook marketplace is so good. When we sold uh, my mother-in-law's house a number of years ago, I was stunned at the amount of stuff I was able to sell just by putting it on Facebook marketplace and people would just come and buy it tables and chairs and vases and all kinds of shit that I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But Facebook really does well for that. So if, if the stuff is inventory, we have to think about what's the inventory that my target market wants to see geographically based in an area that I want to serve. And I put inventory out there and I put inventory out there means I don't have to control the inventory myself. This isn't my own listings. This is simply things like to find a list of homes in my target market that have had a price correction within the last seven days, click this link. And, and an active buyer who's looking to buy a house in my target market who sees that and says, that's the market I'm interested in. I want to see which ones have had a price correction. They click on that link. It, the lead capture ad captures their name and their email address and their phone number, pulls it right into your command account and takes them to that search result that is that list of, of folks, right? When you get folks into your funnel through internet leads, speed to lead matters, right? We, we've got to respond quickly. And there's, there's autoresponders that you can use. Uh, a lot of times people have email autoresponders set up or text messages ready to go. Systematic smart plans ready to go for internet leads that come in. You might even use video email, um, the platform that I send emails to all of you guys from, the email that you should get from me later today announcing Ignite is built on the BombBomb platform, which is a video platform. I don't usually always use it for video email, although I could, but I do send that out as a platform. I think video emails can be really, really good. The thing that influences the conversion though is this, speed. Speed to lead is everything. The research is overwhelmingly clear that conversion rates decline by at least 70% or more if the internet lead is not responded to within five minutes. And it's not that much different from sign calls. It's not that much different from people who just call your telephone number. If you don't respond to them immediately, we are so conditioned right now into immediate response that if we don't get it, we move along. Now, now, I will tell you that if we're nurturing people along through our sales pipeline and we're building a relationship all along the way, that if they send us an email and we don't get back to it in five minutes, this doesn't apply because by that point, we're already in some kind of relationship. But the first time they jump into the funnel, if we don't get back to them within five minutes, the likelihood is we're not going to convert them at all. When I worked for Weikert years ago, back in the early days of the internet lead generation, when Jim had spent gobs of money to build Weikert.com, which quite honestly was a really good internet lead generation portal in the early days of the internet. And it still does some, some, some good stuff, but it was recognized in the real estate space early on as really one of the best portals out there. If you went up to their corporate headquarters, you would go into a big room and it was a, a room of all inside sales reps. And as leads came in, either by dialing 1-800, whatever their phone number was, or they clicked on the banner ad on the internet, as those leads came in, there was a ginormous inbound board on the, on, the, on the wall that you could see throughout the entire room. It looked like the inbound flight board at the airport, where it would just tell you how many are in the queue and how long they've been waiting. And the goal was 
to get that person who had, who had dialed in or came in by email to get them on the phone with an inside sales rep within 60 seconds and to patch them up and to hand them off to an agent on the receiving side within three minutes. That was their goal. And the recognition was that speed to lead mattered and it was so visible and so measurable. Well, if we don't have the bandwidth and the talent to, if we don't have the ability to have our own inside sales reps ready to take these calls, how am I going to do that? Well, autoresponders largely are, are one of the ways to do that. You know, just have an email ready to go that when that lead comes in, you'll get notified. You'll get notified that it's there. And if you don't get that notification, turn it on and know where to look for it. But, but once that notification comes, having something pre-programmed ready to go is important because a lot of times you can't respond because you're busy with someone. But you need to have something queued up and ready to go so you can just click on it. It's almost like when, when you're dial, someone's dialing your cell phone and you're on another call, most smartphones have the ability to send out a pre-programmed text like, I'm driving right now, can I call you later? I'm on another call, can I call you in five minutes? Whatever it is, it's already preset and ready to go. All you do is tap on that message and it goes out to that person. We need to have messages like that. I think sometimes even our, our email messages, our outbound messages need to kind of set the expectation in terms of what follow-up would look like. How long should they expect to wait? What we know is that if we don't respond within five minutes, they're likely to move on. However, if we can't get back to them within five minutes, if we let them know how long to wait and it's not unreasonable, they will hang with you. Um, you know, so, so outbound messages that I think are really good are messages that say things like, you know, um, you know I check my voicemails uh, three times a day at 11 o'clock, two o'clock and five o'clock. I return all calls by the end of the business day. You know, if you've called within the business day, I'll, I'll get to you and I'll call you back after that. Whatever it is, it lets people know how long you expect them to wait. I'm not a huge fan of outbound messages that, that say stuff which isn't true. Like I called an agent the other night from one of our market centers. I'm not going to say who it was. I don't believe it's anybody on this call. Um, but I called him late and because he told me that he had something going on and he wanted me to call him after nine o'clock. And I got his machine immediately and his voice message said, Hey, it's so-and-so. And if you got this voice message, it's because I'm out showing homes to customers just like you. And I'm like, you're not showing homes at 9.30 at night. And if a customer really got that message, what they would say is, dude, you're not showing homes at 9.30 at night. You're lying to me. And if the very first interaction that you have in your very first communication is to lie to somebody, it's not going to end well. I think what's honest is you're not able to take the call. They don't need to know the reason why. But I'm, hey, your call is important to me. I'm not able to take it. Here's what you should expect in terms of what I endeavor to do to turn calls around and respond to you so you're not going to have to wait too long. And if it's after 7 o'clock, I return calls in the next business day. Whatever it is, I think those out by mess. And if you really want to amp it up, the ones I really like are the ones that actually have the date in them. You'll hear sometimes people changing their outbound message every single day. Hey, it's Hal. Today is Friday, the 26th of June. Um, I am, I'm in the office today. I'm checking my voicemail at 11 o'clock and one o'clock and three o'clock, whatever it is. When I know you've recorded that message today, now I truly believe that you're alive and well and working today. If it's recorded and I don't have the date, maybe that's an old outbound message. Maybe it is. If you're going to record daily, make sure you change it. I, I called somebody again, not too long ago, a friend of mine who's not in sales, by the way. But I got her voicemail and it said, hi, this is so-and-so. Today is uh, Thursday, the 17th of November. I'm like, wait, what? 17th of November? What planet are you on? Don't do that. <laughs> if you're going to do it, do it. But it becomes a habit. It becomes a discipline. It just becomes a routine. I change my outbound message every day. When people hit this machine, they know what to expect from me. And then you got to do it. Because if you tell people that you're checking your outbound messages at 11 o'clock, and they're saying, okay, it's now 11.35, haven't heard from them, I'll give them a little more time. Now it's 12.30, now it's 1.30, now it's four o'clock. What I hear is, you checked your message, and obviously my message wasn't really that important to you. That doesn't end well. Speed to lead matters. Have a strategy, have a plan, execute the plan. When you have enough volume in your business, there are people that pay for a calling service. And it's not all that ex expensive. 
it's not all that expect it's expensive to have calls that come in routed to a calling center and and someone else picks up the phone and they answer it and says you know hi uh this is you know um how Ben's is real estate business how can i help you whatever it is whatever your message is and then when they talk to them then they transfer to you and if and again they were responded to in real time but speed to lead is one of the things that is more than anything else going to dictate how well you convert that top of the funnel lead do they stay in your funnel is going to be built around that any questions around that before we move on any strategies that people have in terms of how they're doing that if you don't have a strategy i'd love you to think of one touched on autoresponders and voicemail messages, but, but you, you know where I'm going, right? That's what I want you to think about. Let's keep moving. Being first matters. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the research shows that over 60% of real estate consumers work with the first agent who gets them to an appointment. Now, if that's true, you might feel inclined to say, well, I should try to get you to an appointment right away. Why did you tell me to wait? And you, you, the appointment, the commitment of time is the biggest time possession of, of all and people are less willing to give that up. Why not just get people to an appointment right out of the gate? Well, it's because the person who gets them to the first appropriately timed appointment is, is they don't interview lots of other people then. And, and what we know is, if you've nurtured people through the pipeline all along the way through great smart plans, and that smart plan wasn't just total automation, it was some text messages and some email messages and some telephone messages. And maybe even if you've got a relationship on social, maybe some Instagram direct messages or whatever. But if you've nurtured them along and you've taken that journey through the pipeline from awareness to decision to all that way through, they're more apt to take that final commitment to an appointment with you because they know you. They've got a relationship with you. You're not a stranger. When you get the first person who gets them to the appointment typically gets the business. We, we go on listing appointments and what we find is that many, many times they don't need to speak with anyone else. You want to be first. Sometimes agents say, I want to, they told me they're going to interview three people. I want to be the last one so that I can close them because there's no one else to meet. No, you don't. You want to be the first one because I can promise you, and I'm, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but, but I would tell you that more often than not, if I was first, they didn't meet anyone else. And, and many times they intended to, many times they had planned to, and sometimes there was an objection or a condition that needed to be resolved where they said, you know what, I love everything that you said, but I've got two, more, two other real estate appointments, interviews appointments scheduled, one later today and one tomorrow morning. Many times I had asked the seller, you know, I have really good relationships with most of the agents in this marketplace. If I was to kind of take that off your plate and, and give them a call and let them know that you've made a decision to list your home, but we would be really, really happy to work with them if they brought us a buyer. Would you be willing to sign the paperwork if I was willing to make that call for you? You'd be stunned how many times people said, you do that for me? Oh my God, if you would do that for me and I didn't have to have that awkward conversation, let's sign, where do we sign? Then you pick up the phone and you have that conversation and don't be a jerk, right? You, you, you can't call up and say, hey Bob, sucks being you, dude. I got here first and we're, we're listing this home. <laughs> you can't do that, right? Your co-broke relationships with your other peers in your marketplace are gonna dictate how much business you do. You've got people to like you, but you, you do have to sort of say, look, Bob, you know, I'm here with the Smiths and they told me that they had scheduled an appointment with you. We did actually decide to list the home tonight, but they wanted me to know that they appreciated your interest and they do really want you to know that if you have any buyers out there, we're gonna do everything we can to make it come together easily and smoothly and, and make it you know, a good working relationship together. If you do it with respect, you do it with integrity, but you wanna be first. You just wanna be first, right? Um, other things that influence your ability to convert are great questions. Selling is not telling. In the uh, group that I was in at 10 o'clock, uh, we were going through scripts. And one of the things that I said is that this is a very scripted business. And when you're, when you're people believe that scripts are frequently inauthentic and they're robotic and they're, 
and and when they're done well they're none of the above right but scripts are not telling scripts are scripted questions that guide people through a story where they begin to self-reveal and put the pieces together in their own mind so they can make a decision and take action think about think about a prosecuting attorney in a trial when when the attorney has someone on the witness stand they don't tell the witness anything they ask questions so that the jury can hear the story unfold the narrative unfold and believe me the attorney knows where that questioning is going or they believe they do every once in a while the attorney asks a question and the and the and the defendant or the the witness says something that's totally unexpected and they shut everything down wait time out they know what question they're going to ask. They know what answer they expect to get. They know what follow-up questions they're going to ask and what answer they expect to get so that they can weave a narrative which tells the story that they want the jury to hear so they can make a decision and take the action that they want to take. But it's done through questioning. And so great questioning influences your ability to convert. If all you do in your nurturing is provide information and tell people things, you won't move them through the pipeline the same way. You won't guide them through self-awareness. You won't guide them through decision-making. We've got to have great, great questions, especially critical at that final step when they've moved from decision to action. When they we're trying to determine, are you ready, willing, and able now to take the step, the commitment of time? Now you're going to pop the question. These questions are really the most critical right? These, 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 these assessment questions. And so what I'm going to ask for you is what tool are you using to guide your pre-qualification questions when it comes time to move from that all important phase from decision to action? Do you have a tool that you're using to guide those questions? Anyone? I'm going to share one in a minute, but I'm curious as to what you guys might be using. Anybody can answer that. And if you don't have a guide, then that's cool too. Just let me know. Al, I missed uh, the discourse yesterday with Sally, but I've taken that before. I'm definitely going to sign up for her course. But uh, that's a tool that we used to use to uh, in my other life. <clears throat> yeah, disc. I love. We're talking buyers, about yeah, to assess the buyer's you know readiness by first uh, identifying really um, how they come to a decision. And then that guided your creation of the questions. Awesome. You know, and um, I'm going to share a screen right now. And you're going to see here, um, you see these, we saw in town lead sheets. This, do you see this appendix right here? Somebody tell me if you can see my screen and see what I'm seeing. Yes. Yeah, we could see it. Okay, good. This is the uh, manual. This is the download manual for the lead conversion chapter of Lead Generation 36123. If you download the PDF manual, this is the appendix. And it walks you through here, these lead sheets. And they've kind of broken them down into lead sheets that are for people that are in town or people that are from out of town. And they're broken down into two models, ones that simply have topic prompts on them to guide the questioning and others that are more scripted. So if you look at this lead sheet, this would be the in-town lead sheet for in-town with prompts. So we've got the contact information, the email, all that sort of stuff, demographics here. Here's the prompts. Are you already working with an agent? Is this a single purchase? If yes, no, if no, who else, right? Uh, people who are going to live in a house. All these questions that sort of guide the ready, willing, and able to really determine, is this the right time to move from decision to action? Paul, do you see on the bottom here, behavioral style disc? It gives you an opportunity right here on the lead sheet. Once you understand behavioral profiling, that sounded, uh, that sounded not exactly the way I wanted it to come off. That sounds like law enforcement, but Disc profiling, understanding people's behavioral styles, and we know what that profile is. Are they a driver? Are they? We're going to talk about that in a second. But when you understand that, I'd love for you to come right through on this lead sheet and just circle. What do I think their dominant style is? Are they an S? Are they a C? Are they an I? Because it's going to frame the way that I understand how to communicate with them. But there's, there's a great lead sheet here with the prompts. And then here's the one with the scripts, which actually has the questions written out. Has anyone taken you out and shown you any properties? Yes or no? If, if so, how's that going? 
that's different from the prompt, which just says, are you already working with an agent? It's just scripted a little bit differently. There's a lead sheet for in-town buyers. There's a lead sheet for out-of-town buyers. You can scroll through here and you're going to see, um, you know, just more and more lead sheets. So take a look at these lead sheets. I don't want to get too deep in those today, but I love that as a tool. And what I'm going to say is, you know, use that as a stepping off point. Go back and uh, take a look at it and decide for yourself um, what questions are going to guide the process in the way that's unique. Oops, wrong prompt. I didn't mean to share that screen. I want to share with you the current PowerPoint. Um, what lead sheet, what questions are going to guide people into, uh, into where I want it to go? What are you seeing on your screen right now, just as an aside? I think the, I'm having PowerPoint problems again. Can you tell me what PowerPoint you're seeing on your screen real quick? Asking a question. Okay, good. Because I'm seeing the PowerPoint from my earlier class. I'm like, why is that on my screen? All right, let me see if I can move that. Asking great questions is what you have. That's good. Now I see it. So, so ask great questions. Think about what would be the questions that I could ask that would help me really determine, are you meeting the criteria for ready, willing, and able to the commitment of time? right? They have to do with qualification. They have to do with ability, all that stuff. Use those tools as a way of doing that. All right. Let me get back into the rest of this PowerPoint. Uh, the lead sheets we talked about here. Now, what you want to determine once, you're at, once you are asking great questions all along in the pipeline is, how am I going to classify you in terms of ready, willing, and able? I'm going to meet with you when it's at the point to move from decision to action. But before that, if I've determined that I think you're going to make a decision to buy, sell, or invest at some point, we're going to call that an opportunity. I think you're more than just a contact right now. You've actually expressed an interest. You need to have a classification screen, a system of some sort. You've got to determine how, where are you time-wise into actually getting to that consultation. I know that I want to be the first one to get you there, but where do I think you really are in relationship to that? Um, I used to like to think about A, B, and C. You can use hot, cold, warm. It doesn't matter what you call them. But for me, you were a, a, a top-level lead, an A-level lead. If I thought that you were going to be ready to list or purchase within the next 30 days, you were a B-level lead to me if I thought you were ready to purchase or list within 30 to 90 days. Anybody between 90 days and a year for me was a C. And, and you, that worked for me. You decide what works for you, how tight you want to make those. Um, if you've got a lot of volume to work through, if you've got a lot of leads, you may require somebody to be closer to decision-making to be an A. There are lots of agents that I know that if you're not prepared to take action within the next two weeks, you're not an A lead for them because they've got, and this is typical with the bigger teams that have lots of inside sales agents teeing up lots and lots of appointments. If I'm going on two listing appointments a day, 10 a week, because I've got this whole machine that's generating high quality leads, then if you're not ready to do that within the next two weeks in that model, you might actually be a B lead, right? It doesn't matter. You just have to have a system. And, and it will determine kind of where do you go? How do you move? What's the next step that you take? We're going to look at command for a second. And I want to hopefully get to my command. And I want to show you how to do this in, in command. Uh, so if all goes well, my command dashboard is going to show up. And it looks like it did. Hopefully you see that. In commands, do you see right here where it says opportunities? When you click on that, if you haven't got any opportunities in there yet, at some point you will, that's what we're calling somebody who's expressed an interest and they meet the criteria of more than just a contact. There's someone who's expressed interest and they're moving now into, you know, exploring. If you look in command, we've got one, two, three, four different ways to do this. We've got listing opportunities. We've got buyer opportunities. We've got lease opportunities. I guess there's three. And in each side, each opportunity, there's categories. These are the people that I'm just nurturing along. They're, they're cultivating. They're in the top of the funnel. They're moving from awareness into, into, you know, just deeper and deeper along the funnel. When they're at that critical point of decision to action, now they move into the appointment phase. 
And then from action, when they take that listing, they move into active. When the contract goes under contract, we move them along under contract and all the way to the closing table. But this is where I want to focus right now in the cultivation side. This is where you're going to classify. And again, it could be A, B, and C. This happens to be set up as hot, nurture, and watch. I heard an agent, uh, one of our mega agents, describe it that way, that people for her that are in the very, very top of the funnel, uh, she calls, those are watches for her. And then when they've moved a little bit deeper, she starts to nurture them. And then when they're really moving towards that decision phase, then now they're hotter leads for her. It doesn't matter what you call them as long as you have a system that works for yourself. What we do here is we, we put these contact cards, we, we put them, we move them into these opportunities. What I would simply do here is I would just create an opportunity, right? I click on this. It's going to either ask me to... Um, uh, put somebody in by name, what, what's their name, uh, you know, what does that opportunity look like? There's lots of ways you get them in. But here's what I want you to see. You just move them along from one side to the next side, right? You just move them along, right, as they're moving through. And the thing that's going to trigger the movement through, and let me jump back into the PowerPoint for a second here. Let me go back here. The thing that's going to move them through the pipeline is action. The most important part of lead cultivation is getting micro commitments to taking some act active step to move forward. We're not always closing for the appointment of time, but every interaction that we've got as we're nurturing people through the funnel, every single touch, we don't get off the phone, we don't get off without asking them, what's the next step that you'd be willing to take with me? to move further along. And so for example, if I looked back into my into my contacts there in, in the uh, opportunity side, I had double A buyer. I'm having a little challenge with my computer right now. It's difficult for me to toggle back, so I'm not gonna do that. But on double A buyer, who was in my sort of first phase here, what I, what I recognized was he wasn't a hot enough lead to move on to an appointment yet. It no, makes no sense to get to a, an appointment yet. But double A, you know, my double A client, what would the next step be? This was a listing lead. I'm sorry, I said double A buyer. This was double A seller. He was a listing lead. What would be the next thing that you would commit to do that makes sense at the stage in the process that you're at? And that's an assessment that you're going to have to make based on your interaction with this particular person. For me, what I had assessed was, you know what, you're a potential seller. It's, you know, it's, it's quite a few months before you're going to really be ready to put your ass on the market. Asking you to meet with me right now is silly. You're not ready to, you wouldn't be willing to. What would you be willing to do? Would you be willing to read a, an article on home uh, repair, simple home repairs that you can do to, to kind of uh, at low cost, create more value for your home at, this, at the time of resale? Would that be something that would be of interest to you and if the answer was yes, then the micro commitment would be, I'm going to send you this article. I'd love you to take a look at it. And then I'm going to call you back in a week and just answer any questions that you have. Would that be okay? Does that sound fair? I, I know that you're not going to get to an appointment, but I need you to commit to do something because movement is the key to pipeline management. If we don't have movement through the pipeline, what we have is stagnation. And the only way you're going to move is if you take another little step and another little step, and another little step. What we do too often is we say, you're six months away, we're just gonna wait, we're just gonna wait, and then hope that we're gonna stay in touch when the time comes and you'll be ready to take that next step with me. I need you to take this journey with me. What would you be willing to do? Would you be willing to read this article? Would you be willing to um, receive an email that shows what comps are selling for in the monthly nurture in the market where you're selling or the market where you're moving? Would staying aware of the market in that way be a step that you'd be willing to take with me? Getting the micro commitments is the key to pipeline management. And, um, and it's a critical step. And it requires us to be thoughtful. It's not one size fits all. It's going to be unique based on the conversations that you have and the relationship that you have. 
But if you can get that micro commitment moving all the way through, then what happens is you've been taking this journey together. That final step to the appointment is not this big, scary step because I know you, I trust you. We've been doing this together for months, right? Get to know your leads. Get to know your leads, right? This is where behavioral style comes in, Paul. And I'm glad you took Sally's course on DISC. It's a really good course. You know, treat people the way that they want to be treated. What we know is that the golden rule that we learned in kindergarten is treat everybody the way that you want to be treated, but that's not good enough when it comes to, to working with other people because you may want to be treated differently than they do. We've got to take the golden rule and yank it up into the platinum rule, which is treat people the way they want to be treated. And we know that there's different styles. I like to think of these, and, and, and Paul, I don't know if Sally kind of shared this, um, but I've been spending a lot of time training and being certified in doing DISC. And, and I like to think of DISC into sort of two continuums. I wish I had a slide on this, but if you look at the screen, just draw it into quadrants, if you will, a, a line right across the middle, a line top to bottom into four equal boxes. At the top of the screen would be people that are comfortable taking risk. At the bottom of the screen on the continuum would be people that are not so comfortable with risk. On the right side of the screen are people that are influenced more by relationships. On the left side of the screen are people that are influenced more by logic. And what you have is this kind of spectrum of, of people that's this whole kaleidoscope of some people that are more comfortable taking risk but are more influenced by relationships or comfortable taking risks more influenced by logic. And the same on the bottom, less risk tolerant, but more relationship, less risk tolerant, but more logical. And that corresponds basically with these styles. D, the dominance. The dominance is kind of that upper left quadrant, that risk tolerant folks. They're comfortable taking risk. They're not really swayed too much by emotions. They're really just more typically driven by outcome and logic. D, driver, dominance, I, influencer, that influencer. Sally Ponchik is a classic example, Paul, of an influencer. She's comfortable taking some risk, but she's not a gambler. She takes calculated risks, but for her, it's very relationship-based. It's all about relationship for Sally. You look down in that bottom right corner, that bottom right corner where risk tolerance is low, they're not really comfortable taking risk, but it's all about relationships. That's the S, the steadies. Those are the folks that make up really two thirds of the population actually leads with that S behavioral style. They, 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 they like to know what to expect. They don't like surprises. They don't like chaos. I will tell you that just the very act of moving in and of itself from one house to another creates a certain amount of S in all of us because there's so much disruption and chaos that can happen. But um, C, the C, the cautious folks, the bottom left quadrant, they're not risk tolerant. They're not really swayed by emotion and relationship as much as logic, in fact. And what we know is that all of us have all of this, all of this in us. We're a kaleidoscope of all of this. But most of us, at some point, develop preferences for how we like to behave. And when we know what those behavioral styles are, it just makes it easier for us to know how do we communicate in a way that, that fits that style. I like to think of DISC sometimes as what's the, what's the Achilles heel? What's the biggest fear? If we know that logic gets people to think, but it's that emotions that get them to act, what we also know is that the emotion of fear is a far better predictor of action than the emotion of like and attraction. You are far more likely to take action if you're afraid than if you just desire something. So what I like to think about is what are people most afraid of based on these behavioral styles? And what we know is that for the Ds, the biggest fear for the D is don't waste my time. Don't waste my time. And so if I'm talking to a high D, I know that I need to get to the point quickly. I know that I need to not spend a lot of time with chit chat. I need to know that I have to prioritize what's the most important thing that they need to hear and say that first. For the eyes, does anybody have an idea what the eyes' biggest fear would be? That person who is all relational but comfortable taking risks. Do you know what the biggest fear is of the eye? Any thoughts? I lead with eye. That might help you. Lack of trust. I don't know. What was it? Lack of trust. 
Lack of trust. No, that's not so much it. The eyes are, are folks who are really comfortable out there. They're performers in many ways. They love to be in the front of the room like me in some ways. I was a music major in college. I love to be out in front. It's fear of rejection. You yeah, know, okay. fear of rejection for eyes. I mean, it is, it is disabling. You look at great creative types and many times you look at a creative artist, a performer, and they've had a great, great, great performance. I, I, I think about so many artists who go out there and they read the reviews and they have like tons and tons of great reviews and they have this one review who knocked them and that's the thing that kills them. It's that one bad review in the sea of love. And it hurts. Eyes really struggle with fear of rejection. So when I'm communicating and I'm cultivating a lead who I suspect is a high eye, I have to be reinforcing that they're making great decisions. I've got to keep building them up and letting them know that they're making good special decisions, all that stuff. I, gotta, I, I don't want to bluff, right? But I know that that's important to them. So I've got to keep building that up. S, the steadies. The biggest fear is being out of control. The biggest fear is chaos. And so every step along the way, I've got to be guiding people through what to expect next. Because when they know what to expect, they're less afraid. And that's their biggest fear. And so every micro commitment along the way is let's talk about what to expect. Let's talk about what the intended outcome is. Let's talk about when you expect to hear from me again. They love the phone message that says, I can't take your call right now, but this is when to expect to hear from me. The steadies love that. The C's, the cautious folks on the other side, you know, they're cautious for a reason. And the reason why is because the biggest fear of the high C is they don't want to make a mistake. The D's don't care. <laughs> it's like the D's are like ready, fire, aim. I'm just going to shoot. You know, I just keep shooting. I'm going to hit something. The C's are ready, aim, 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 aim. Adjust your sights one more time. Aim. The D's are like, would you freaking shoot already? You're killing me here. The C's, it's not that they're indecisive. A lot of times we believe that C's, the, they get so bogged down in the details that they're just indecisive. It's not about indecision. It's just that they don't want to get it wrong. And, and so when we're nurturing our leads and working with our high C's, what we really need to be sure of is that everything that we're doing is guiding them to believe and to gain confidence in the decisions that they're making so that they can trust that the action that they take when they're ready to take it is the right action and that they don't have to think it through anymore, right? And when you know your lead's style, which comes by learning about this, learning how to assess for this, I'll give you a real quick and easy, a real quick and easy on, on how a thumbnail sketch on somebody's behavioral profile. It's a four part question and it would simply be this. If, um, if your very best friend or significant other was asked to describe you in one of these ways and they could only pick one, which would it be? Are you all about business? Are you the life of the party? Is it friends and family first always? Or just show me the facts? Which one do you think they would use to describe you? Are you all about business? Are you the life of the party? Is it friends and family first? Or just the facts? And each one of those corresponds with D. Are you all about business? D, driven. Are you the life of the party? I, influencer. Is it friends and family relational? S, steady. Or just show me the facts. C, cautious. That's a quick question that I like to ask people real quick because it gives you a real quick thumbnail. And sometimes I ask them, you know, you may, I'm going to ask you a question. You may think it's kind of nuts, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And you ask that question and then you ask them, do you have any idea why I asked you that? And here's what I've learned. The truth is all of us have this behavioral preference and this behavioral style. And if I can learn how to communicate with you in ways that is that, that kind of sync up with what works for you, we're going to have a better conversation. And, and people are like, that's cool. I, I appreciate the fact that you think enough to think that way. You know, um, Paul, I didn't respond to your chat box question. I just noticed it when you said bringing value earns the next step. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, and this paying attention to behavioral style builds relationship was also greases the skids to that next step as well. So, so get to know your leads, get to know the behavioral styles. Um, okay. Build rapport, communicating in a way that's meaningful to the person who you're talking to, not just that's the way that you prefer. 
I worked with a boss years ago who was a super, super high D. And um, many times bosses get to be bosses because they're high D. You know, they're driven. They're, they're all about business. But this was a person who was so out of sync with, with, with the way that his behavior impacted the people around him. It was all about the project and the initiative and getting things done on time and meeting expectations and all those different things that he didn't really notice that the people around him that were actually having to execute were turning into pretzels and, 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 and just stressing out of their gourd because he was just out of tune with that. And when people would try to point that out to him, his response was, we're a successful organization. If people want to work with this in this organization, they're just going to have to understand that that's my leadership style. And if they can't cut it, they can work somewhere else. You know, that's an old school mentality. It's still out there, still in some aspects of business. I think the the more um, current, and I, I, I like to use the word enlightened uh, idea in business is that leaders should learn how to adapt their leadership style so that the they, they kind of are more in line with the behavioral style of the people who report to them rather than ask people to change their style to the leaders. The leader has to be the most flexible in the pack. It's not to say that you don't, or you don't hold consistent to the vision. It's not to say you don't hold consistent to the outcome. But the way that you lead is by communicating, guiding people, not the way that you want to be treated, but the way that they do. And it builds great rapport right? Bill builds great rapport. Final tips here for getting an appointment. Number one, we know people's time is their most valued commodity. The time commitment is the hardest to convert. But here's tip number one, ask for it when it's time. You got to ask for the appointment when it's time. It's amazing how many times people just think that the customer will ask for the appointment when they're ready. They won't. When you're sensing that it's time because you've nurtured them along and you've assessed and you've nurtured and you've, you've determined ready, willing, and able to so when it's time to meet, you got to ask because if you don't, someone else will. There's this great country song and I, I can't remember the, the artist's name right now and, uh, or the name of the song as I'm thinking about it. But the point is every country song tells this terrible tale right, of, of, of love gone bad. And, and the guy, the, the, the story goes, and some of you may know the song, it's sort of a country pop tune about the guy who, who had this girl that he was interested in and he, the, he had always hoped that uh, he would build up the courage to ask. And then one day he gets invited to her wedding and he's invited to go, but he's dying inside because he should have been the one to ask and he didn't have the courage to do it. When it's time to ask, ask because someone else will. And you'll be on the outside looking in. You've got to ask for the appointment. But the other thing that, that helps is you've got to be an expert and you've got to communicate your expertise. As you nurture your way through the pipeline, there's micro commitments to what's the next step you're going to take with me. But part of that journey is establishing yourself as knowledgeable about the process, that you're an expert in the process. Be confident in your abilities, right? Because no one is, is super comfortable committing to an appointment with somebody who comes off as wishy-washy and, and, and not sure of themselves. Be confident. Have a list of questions, use the lead sheet, ask them the questions, listen to the answers, come from contribution. Stephen Covey says it, begin with the end in mind. Think about where you want to go in the communication. When you're listening, don't listen just to reply. So you're playing tennis, you say something, so now I have to say something. Listen intently to understand, right? Seek agreement, respond quickly, communicate in person, all these different things will make it easier to get to that final, that final stage of appointment. So here's the thing as we wrap up, it's almost quarter after. Um, I think pipeline management, lead conversion, is for many agents the bigger challenge than lead generation. We can get lots and lots of folks into our bucket. We can get lots and lots of folks into our funnel. I was talking to an experienced agent, a well-known agent, somebody who historically does really decent business over the years. And I asked her about her database and she told me that her, the database size was thousands of people. And I said, talk to me about how much business you've done in the last year. Her business was off. But even in the best of times, it was probably no more than, you know, 15 units a year. If you've got thousands of people in your funnel, 
and you're only converting 15 appointments a year, your conversion is your problem. It's not lead generating anymore. It's converting. It's moving people through. It's, it's recognizing, I'm going to go all the way back to the very first slides here. It's recognizing that we've got to connect with you in this awareness phase and nurture you along until you start to express interest. And when you express interest, at that point, you now become an opportunity for me. And how do thou, now do I commit to a series of small micro commitments together that we take this journey together to move further along into decision. And then in decision, now I use my lead sheets to guide really intent questions about ready, willing, and able to move on to the final step of action. When we learn how to master this skill, which we don't teach enough and well enough in my estimation in real estate sales, these are where you move from a hobbyist to a business and a business that really becomes kind of a machine, kind of a machine with predictable sales volume year after year after year. It's this idea of how do I constantly fill my funnel? How do I move my funnel? How do I constantly service the business comes out of the funnel? But it's this skill set as much as any. It's the crossbar of the Parthenon back here. There it is. This is the crossbar that keeps the house from falling down. We need a great foundation so it doesn't collapse. But the walls are not going to stand up unless they're tied together with the crossbeams. And the conversion skill set is the crossbeam. So with that, we're going to wrap up a little bit. Give me some thoughts, takeaways, ahas. I know a number of you had to jump off. We're down to eight here in the room, but I'd love to hear some takeaways from today. How that example you just put on up, um, about that agent with 2,000 in the database. Yeah. I think uh, you just get lost in the weeds sometimes with – yeah. As a new agent trying to build your database when you just got to kind of get down to brass tacks, so to speak. Because you know what happens is we hear all this talk that says, okay, if you've got a database and you've got these smart plans going that you can get predictable lead conversion. Yeah, that's true. And yet what will happen is you'll move people into, here's the, the picture, here it is. You'll move people through your smart plans into interest. But now, if you don't start to get the micro commitments of taking the next step and the next step and the next step, the smart plans alone won't do that. Here's the, and I'll show you real quick. I'm going to go back into my command real fast because I want you to see this. In my command database, do you see it here? You see double A seller here in my command database? Here's how I do it. I'm going to just go into here. I'm going to open up his contact card as I'm moving him along. Do you see his contact card here? See where it says notes here? Tell me you're seeing the notes section here. Somebody just throw in the chat that you can see AA seller's contact card. Yes, we can see it. Okay, you can see it, good. Here's how I'm managing those micro commitment steps. I'm doing it in the notes field. I don't know a better way in command and if there is one, someone can tell me. But if I know that now you're in my opportunities, you're in the interest phase, you're in opportunities, I'm moving you along through a series of micro commitments to decision and action, I'm keeping track of that in notes. In my notes section, I'm gonna put a note, what is the next step? And in this class that I taught a while back, the next step was that this is a person that had a lot of things in this scenario that I created. They had a full house that they had to sell a lot of stuff and get rid of stuff and declutter, okay. Then the next step is, let's, would you be willing to inventory in the home all the different things that you want to sell? Would that be a step that you'd be willing to take? Terrific. Why don't I call back in the two weeks and see how it's going? And I'd call back and I'd ask, hey, how did it go in terms of you putting that list together of stuff that you're going to sell before you, you get ready to go on the market? And if they took the step, terrific. Now, what's the next one you're willing to take with me? And we'll think about that together. If they didn't take the step, then I got to go back and ask, how come? Was it too big a step? Did they not know how to take the step? Are they not ready to take that biggest step yet? Who knows, right? But it gives me a sense of what do I need to do then? If you weren't willing to do this, how about we take a st an easier step then? What if I sent you an article to read about something you know, related to the next process? Would you be willing to do that? Because it's not as active, right? It's just always this sense of what's the next appropriate step that moves you through? 
I did it by using the note field to keep track of that. And then when we, it came time to call double A seller, I'd look at that note, I'd say, how'd that go? And then I'd change the note for the next time. Make sense? Any other takeaways from today? One more and then we'll call quits. We'll get you out early on a Friday because it's a beautiful Friday. All right, if there's no more takeaways, I hope that means that you're, uh, you're just stewing on all this and it's all the gears are clicking in your head. Here's what we're gonna go, we're wrapping this up on Monday. Uh, Monday, we're gonna do a quick session on living your goals. Uh, we're going to tie this all together with a little bit of goal planning and how do you put this all together and kind of um, kind of map this out into your business plan going forward. And, uh, and that's where we're going to go on Monday. And then this session ends for this cycle. On Wednesday, we'll pick it up with Ignite 2.0 again. That'll run for 16 sessions, take us into August. And then surprisingly enough, we're going to go right back in to this lead gen course again. These two courses in this 11 o'clock time block, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, just go back and forth. You know, we have so many new folks coming in that they've never seen it before. But, and what we recognize is that mastery is through repetition. This, this content more than any other wasn't designed to be just experienced once. It was really been, it was written to take it again and again and again. The same way that the MREA wasn't meant to be read once. The more you kind of hear it again and again and again at different phases of your business, Different things resonate differently. Different things suddenly click in again. And so we offer it enough that you do have the chance of taking it a bunch of times and hearing different things each time that move you further along, right? So that's where we are going forward. And um, if there's not anything else, we're gonna call it quits here for today. All right, guys, then I guess that's where we're gonna park it. Have yourself a good day. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. It's gonna be warm out there. So enjoy it, get out if you can, um, stay safe, stay social distanced, but uh, try to get out and, and, uh, and get some sun. And I'll look forward to talking to you guys again on Monday. Thanks, Al, good weekend. Thank you, Hal. Thanks, Al.